post on um, Canvas to remind us of what we should be doing to be responsible. So, uh, first of all, if you're sick, do not come to class. Okay, like no one needs to be a hero. I will help you get caught up with whatever you miss. But you really should not be coming to school sick, like even if it's not COVID related, because no one wants to get exposed to that. So please be super courteous. Like I know it's not easy to miss class, but we just have to do that. Um, I know that you guys all have good hand hygiene, so that's great. You've all been wearing masks, which is awesome. So I know they're super uncomfortable. Like I feel like I have a weird face. Like my mask, like like I have a narrow bridge on my nose, so like the mask just always kind of falls a little bit, but then it's tight here. So anyway, I get it. So we just gotta try our best to keep our mask on. Um, if you're waiting for a COVID result, you should not be here. So <laughs> that's another thing, because you don't know if you're positive, right? So if you're waiting on a test result, you shouldn't be here. If you're actively sick, you shouldn't be here. If you think you've been exposed, then I would just follow whatever guidelines are laid out to you, depending on your exposure. So like, for instance, if, you, if it's someone that like you're working close with at work over the day, that would be an exposure, but if it's someone that's on the same floor as you and you never see them, that's probably not an, a true exposure. Um, but you can feel free to get tested whenever you want, but just know that if you get tested, even if you're asymptomatic and you're positive, then you are technically supposed to stay away. So um, you do whatever you need to keep yourself safe, um, but I just ask that you be really respectful about coming to campus if there's weird circumstances. And I'm not like an expert at contact tracing or anything, um, but if you have a question, you can always ask me before you come to campus. Um, any questions about that? Okay. I think it's like a hard situation because we have to trust people to do the right thing. And I feel like you guys being educated, you would do the right thing. But like the general population, you're like, no. Nah. Like, I trust you guys being micro students more than I trust like the average person to like know what's right. So. Um, anyway, so hopefully we'll all stay healthy. I'm sending positive vibes out to everyone. Um, okay, so I want to take a look at the calendar because sometimes I, I do get behind a little bit. Uh, let's see, what day is it? Today is the 8th? Okay, so we're like a little bit behind. Like we just started chapter 6. Chapter 6 and 7 are pretty short. Chapter 8 is a little more intensive. So we'll just kind of see where the schedule goes. Um, if we have to, we can always like skip chapter nine, because it's kind of related to chapter eight, and then have the exam that day instead. So I'll kind of play it by ear and just see what's happening. I think I'll use that as my contingency plan, um, that we might skip chapter nine and just move the exam to that day. Okay, but I'll let you know too, like I'll put reminders on campus. So I never move an exam up, because that would be just rude. I usually just uh, move it back a day if I need to. All right, so we're working towards trying to get through chapter eight. Chapter eight is where the next exam is going to be. Um, I haven't put the, oh yeah, I need to put the practice quiz up. I'll do that when I get a chance. Um, and then we don't have lab this week because of the holiday, but we will continue with lab number three, which is street for isolation uh, next week. So I don't know, do you guys like, I've been posting videos of the lab. Do you, is that, is that good? Does anyone watch them or do you just wait to like come? I'm just curious. Like when I posted videos about lab, does anyone watch them? Like, <laughs> no? Okay, well, I don't mind posting them because I already have them, so I'll post them um, in case you ever have to miss, basically. Like if you ever have to miss lab because of COVID or whatever, or if you just forget afterwards, like what we talked about and you want to take the quiz, then you can watch that video. So I'll continue to just post those, I guess. Okay, okay any questions about class in general or anything else? Okay, so no lab this week, so you get to just be free afterwards. All right. Let me look at the PowerPoint. It feels like that was eight years ago. Let's see if I can remember where we were. I think we were talking about physical and chemical requirements for growth. I left off talking about oxygen requirements, so I'm going to go back to that. Okay, 
So we talked about how, how do you grow these guys um, in the lab? Like if, what conditions do you have to provide for them? And so <clears throat> there was two main categories that they um, divided the requirements into, which was physical requirements and then chemical requirements. So what physical conditions do you have to consider if you want to grow these successfully? Temperature. Temperature. It. pH. And then there's one more. Pressure. Pressure. So these are the things that are just very basic to like keeping something alive. Um, and different organisms have different temperature requirements. So we talked about um, sicrophiles, mesophiles, and thermophiles. Those are the three main categories. So they either like cold or medium or hot temperature. And then most things like a neutral pH, which would be a pH of like 6.5 to 7.5. And then anything below 6.5 would be acidic, and anything above 7.5 would be basic. So most things like to be in the middle, like most living things like neutral pH, but there are exceptions in either direction. And then the pressure is primarily like the osmotic pressure. So it could be osmotic, which is water moving, or it could be like atmospheric pressure. So either of those things could impact the way the cell is like um, staying like in a normal state. Okay, then the chemical requirements, what kind of things are those? What do all living things need? They need food, and specifically, what do they need? They might need oxygen, carbon, and then there was a bunch of other elements that we listed. So there was elements, sorry, I know you can't see this very well. I'm going to draw it back up here. So the elements were things like um, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Basically anything that like you're made out of, you need to intake somehow. So a lot of the chemical requirements are um, nutrients. Nutrients and energy. So it's stuff that you need for metabolism, potentially. It's either the building blocks that you need, or it's an energy source. So all things usually use some kind of carb as an energy source. Some kind of sugar is usually the energy source, and sugars are carbon molecules. Okay, so oxygen, yes, you're literally made out of oxygen. Like that's what we said organic chemistry basically is, is like a ca uh, carbon attached to a hydrogen, an oxygen, or a nitrogen, or some other thing. But you also might need oxygen for metabolism. So this is what this chart is diagramming, is that there's different categories of organism depending on what your oxygen requirement is. So in the blue are the names of the types of organisms. And then you can correlate that with where they're growing in the test tube. Um, because what, where is more oxygen in the test tube? At the top, right? And then there's less at the bottom. So um, that'll tell you what they are depending on where they're growing. So things that are growing at the top are aerobic. So those are obligate aerobes. They have to have oxygen. The things that are growing at the bottom are obligate anaerobes. They don't like oxygen. So it's poisonous to them. Um, most, uh, a lot of human pathogens are facultative anaerobe. Facultative means optional. So they can grow with or without oxygen, but they actually prefer oxygen. See how more of them are growing at the top? So this one people mix up a lot. They'll say like, it doesn't like oxygen, but I'm like, it actually does, but it can do okay without oxygen. So it's a more flexible growth pattern. Um, then there's the aerotolerant anaerobe. So it's still an anaerobe because more of it's at the bottom, but it can tolerate air. So it's not quite as strict as this one. It is capable of growing in the presence of some oxygen. And then the pickiest one is the micro aerophile. So micro means a little bit, and then air means oxygen, and then phyllos to love. Notice that it's floating kind of in the middle. 
it likes exactly a little bit of oxygen. So those are the ones that can be a little more tricky to grow in lab. Um, you can grow the ones that don't like oxygen in the lab by incubating them in an incubator that pumps gas into it or um, chambers that remove the oxygen. So there are ways to grow those in the lab. So if you were asked, do all, do all um, organisms require oxygen for metabolism? You would say no, because you can see right here that that's not true. If you're an animal, you do need oxygen. But there are bacteria that have a variety of levels of oxygen that they can grow in. Now, you do need oxygen as an element, though. Because you're literally made out of oxygen. Like all of our cells are made out of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. But that's a different thing that I'm saying than versus this. So like practical example of this, like if you took a blood sample from a patient to do a blood culture, they're going to grow it aerobically and anaerobically. Because different things will grow in that tube depending on what it is that you suspect is causing the problem. And then that's a process of elimination. Because generally they can't be both. Like some things that like that can be micro or they can be facultative anaerobe, but if you remove all the oxygen, they don't grow very well. And so it's a way that you can kind of figure out what it might be. All right, the other things are food and nutrients. So those are called those organic growth factors. So this is, if you think about it, like humans take supplements, like we take supplements for things we're missing sometimes, like zinc or iron, or certain vitamins that we can't really make ourselves, that's pretty much what organic factors are. They're little extra goodies that the bacteria can't necessarily synthesize themselves. And so if you were trying to grow them in the lab, you would provide them with those materials so that they could grow. All right, so the culture media is what you are giving them food um, with. So you guys have worked with auger plates, which is solid growth medium. And then um, we will see broth, which is liquid. A lot of times you put them in broth because you want to dilute the sample. But also, like, they grow faster in broth. So imagine that, like, you were just in a bowl of food, and you're like, mm -hmm. just, like, eat the food because it's, like, all around you. So a lot of times in the broth, they'll grow a lot faster because their food is just, like, surrounding them versus on a plate, they're kind of eating along the plate. I guess it's kind of weird to imagine. Um, so they grow, they grow well, but just not quite as fast. So it really just depends on what you're doing. And the important thing is that it has to be sterile. So we use an autoclave to sterilize the media that we prepare for you guys. It uses high heat and pressure to prevent microbial growth. And then we can pour it into different containers. So if you pour it in a plate, that's a Petri dish. You can also pour it in a tube. You can make a slant, which is where you tilt it, and it will make a little surface for you to work on. So it really just depends on the application. If you're going to use auger or broth, and then what kind of container you're going to put it in. But basically, it needs to be sterile before you inoculate that media so that you don't have any contaminants that give you ambiguous um, results. OK, so there has to be an energy source. So it's usually a sugar, and there has to be elements in that media. And if you think again, culture media is the food that you're giving them to grow, that you're giving them to culture, uh, to culture them in the lab. So you need an energy source, you need elements, and you need organic factors. And if they are fastidious, they require many growth factors. So said another way, those are the pickier organisms that are harder to grow. So one of the questions on your little get to know a bacterium assignment was like, is this organism considered fastidious or non-fastidious? And fastidious means they have a lot of growth requirements. And non-fastidious means they don't really. Like, they can grow pretty easily. Um, then there's different levels to how comp complicated the media is. If the organism is very fastidious, then you're probably going to use chemically defined media and that's where you know the exact composition. So it doesn't vary from batch to batch. It has to be the exact amount of each ingredient. Most things, though, you can just use complex media. So complex media would be TSA, which is what you guys use every day to grow the bacteria on the plates. 
And TSA is undefined because it can vary a little bit from batch to batch, but it still has complex ingredients because it has partially digested proteins, like I think casein is a meat protein, and then soybeans are a plant protein. And so it's a complex media in that it has complex ingredients, but it's undefined because of, it varies from batch to batch. So organisms that are okay with that will grow on TSA. If they're like, no, I need exactly 0.5 grams of whatever, then they won't grow well on that media. So that's why TSA works pretty well as a general purpose media because most things can grow on TSA. And then nutrient media is just this idea that it can support a lot of different organisms. So it's very basic ingredients. They're not as complicated, I guess. So there is a media that's like literally called nutrient auger. And I forgot what's in it, but it's just like sugar like and stuff that most things are like, okay, this is all right. So which kind of plate you use depends on what you're trying to grow. And then there'll be specific media that you use to identify specific organisms. Um, TSA is what's called non-selective because pretty much anything will grow on TSA. And then selective plates, I'll show you examples of that, they will select for certain things. Okay, I mentioned that you can grow these guys without oxygen if you need to, and there's different ways to do that depending on what kind of organism you're trying to grow. Um, we are very high tech and rich here at Rose State. We use a candle jar. It's a pickle jar, and we put a candle in it, and then we close the lid, and then that sucks all the oxygen out, like by the candle burning. But that's like old school method and it works. So things that are facultative anaerobes, they grow a little bit better in the candle jar. So that's things like some of the strep will grow better in the candle jar than they will in an air incubator. You can also buy a commercial gas pack. They're just a little bit more expensive. They're not that practical if you need to make tons of plates because the, they are kind of expensive. But basically it's this canister and you put this packet in that when you add water, it releases gas into the chamber and you use a vacuum pump to seal that lid down to make a tight seal. And then it'll temporarily turn that chamber anaerobic. And they usually have a little indicator strip. As long as that strip has turned whatever color it's supposed to turn, it means that you have an anaerobic environment. So those things are nice because you can just pick it up and put it in an incubator or you can just incubate it on the counter, but you're reducing the oxygen. Now, if you have a very strict anaerobe, like some people on our um, floor work with Clostridium, like uh, Clostridium perfringens, which is a cousin of Clostridium difficile, which is C. diff. C. diff is a strict anaerobe, so it does not grow in the presence of oxygen. And so you can use a full anaerobic chamber, which is kind of awkward at first with like these space gloves, you put it in there, it sucked all the air out, and no air is falling in there. And so it makes an anaerobic environment. So you can leave your plates in there, and you can put your reagents in there so that you can work with those bacteria. So you can get around the oxygen issue. You can incubate things anaerobically by using a special incubator, using a special chamber, using a candle jar, using a gas pack, anything that will help you get rid of oxygen that are around the bacteria. Okay, some other things to consider. Some things have never been grown in the lab. So then you might wonder, how do we know that they exist? Um, we can detect the genetic material in, in samples and then compare it to a database of things that we know and see if this is a new thing or if this is uh, something that we already know about. Some of them have to be grown in an animal. So you need a whole animal to grow them. So random fact, leprosy, the leprosy causing organism, which leprosy isn't really a thing anymore. It's like a rare disease but armadillos harbor it. So you really, if you ever see an armadillo, like don't touch it, like, because they have bacteria and stuff. Um, but you have to use the whole animal to grow them. Obligate intracellular means that they have to be grown in a cell. So some of the tick-borne pathogens, like rickettsia, some of the human pathogens, like chlamydia, if you were going to culture it, you would need to use a cell culture to do that. So you'd have to have cells to grow them in. Some need CO2 or less oxygen, so that's where we talked about the candle jar, the special incubator. Some of them are super dangerous. 
So we'll talk about the biosafety levels. Biosafety level four is the highest. That's where you have like special entryway and, and um, special filtering, negative pressure so that nothing can escape the lab. So that's like the doomsday scenario, right? Like when you see the apocalypse movies when they're in the full suit and they have a very um, locked down facility, that would be the highest level BSL-4. But that really represents the fewest labs, like because most labs don't work with select agents like that. Okay, um, so now going back to the media. So we said that there's general purpose media that will grow pretty much anything. And then if you are interested in growing only a certain thing, you're gonna use selective media. It has something in it that will select for the thing that you're interested in. So a lot of times selection is through using antibiotics, it's through using um, detergents that will inhibit certain things and allow other things to grow, dyes that they can use that will basically inhibit the thing that you are not interested in and select for the thing that you are interested in. And this makes sense to do if you take a clinical sample that's really complex. Like for example, a fecal sample is gonna have tons of different bacteria in it, right? But you're not interested in all the bacteria that are in a poop. You're only interested in the ones that can make someone sick. And so you use media that will select for the things that make people sick. And there's different mechanisms for that. There's all kinds of selective media. Now once you select for those things that you're interested in, how do you tell those apart from each other? And that's where the differential component comes in. So a lot of times a media is selective and differential and it'll physically differentiate between them, meaning that they will look different on the plate. And I'll show you an example of this. I feel like visually it makes more sense when there's examples of this. All right, so on the right side is non-selective media. And that's a black and white picture, so it looks a little bit different than you would have seen in real life. But if I didn't have arrows telling me what those colonies were, would I know what those were? on a TSA plate. I wouldn't, right? I'd be like, well, they're white. One of them is bigger than the other. And that kind of makes sense with the labels on because the M actually stands for micrococcus. And micrococcus are really small. So it makes sense to me that their colonies would be small. I happen to know from experience, E. coli grows really fast and its colonies are like huge. So I know that from experience, but I wouldn't know that if I just like looked at that plate without labels. Anything will grow on TSA pretty much. That's why it's non-selective. Now selective media, only certain things are gonna grow on it. And then differential is meaning that they're gonna look different depending on what they're doing physically to the media. So the differential component is usually based off of metabolism. Like how are they metabolizing the media differently? And then there's pH changes that occur because of that, and then they put dyes in the media, where if they make a certain pH change, then the colony will turn that color, because that pH change will trigger the dye to get released. So this example of selective differential media is looking at um, something called coliforms versus other bacteria. Coliforms are bacteria that are commonly found in poop. And when you test like drinking water, there should be like not coliforms. Like there shouldn't be like any really. Like you should only get maybe one colony per sample of water. And so coliforms can be an indicator of if that water is safe to drink. But coliforms are kind of generic. It's just stuff that's commonly found in feces. But there are other things that might be more um, important to know that they're like E. coli, right? Because we know that E. coli can be pathogenic. Coliforms are not necessarily pathogenic, but if there's enough of them, they're what's called an indicator organism. So a high coliform level could mean that there's more pathogens in that water. But if you just use a regular plate, you wouldn't know who was who. You wouldn't know the coliform level and you wouldn't know what the subsequent pathogens were. And so this media is designed to select for things that grow in fecal matter. And I don't know what exactly ingredients those are, but they use some kind of ingredients that things that grow in poop like. 
And then they put a differential component, which is usually different carbohydrates. And different pathogens can use carbohydrates differently. And then that subsequent pH change, if they do use that carbohydrate, is what makes these different colors. So now you can see on this plate that it gives you a lot more information, right? Because let's say you're like, all right, there's coliform contamination. That's a sign that there could be other pathogens in this water. Well, what are the other pathogens? Well, E. coli is a pathogen. And Proteus is potentially a pathogen, but I'd probably be more concerned about the E. coli. So now what I can do is that I've isolated E. coli because only E. coli will turn magenta on this plate. And now I can take that colony and do other testing on it to figure out what kind of E. coli it is. Is it a scary E. coli or is it just a regular E. coli? So hopefully you can see how that tells you way more information. Okay, TSA is not going to tell you visually which one is which, but if you use media that is selective or differential, it tells you a lot more about what it is because of the way they're biochemically using that media. So this is something that will come up again in lab um, because we have selective and differential media for gram positives and negatives. All right, so we said that you need to work with sterile media and you also have to do what's called aseptic technique, which this will be what lab number three talks about. An aseptic technique means that you do a procedure without contamination. So you don't contaminate yourself, you don't contaminate your experiment, you don't contaminate your environment, right? Because these things are invisible. Like it would be terrible if you just spilled a thing of salmonella and then you're like, ah, and then someone else comes over and is like, <laughs> like doing their thing, right? So that's why we kind of have to assume that everything's contaminated like when we come into the lab, because most people are good about cleaning themselves up after themselves, but we don't know, right? So the reason we don't want contamination, especially in clinical micro, is because then you don't know what's actually causing the problem, because the whole point is that we're trying to diagnose people with something, right? So we don't want any ambiguity. We want to say, like, yes, this person has salmonella. We don't want to be like, maybe they have salmonella, right? So we don't want contaminants in our in our samples that we're working with. So one of the ways that you can get rid of contaminants is to do this procedure called a streak for isolation. And you guys will see this several times because you're going to physically do it. Um, and you'll learn about it again in lab. But essentially, like let's say you have a mixed sample of bacteria and you want to separate them from each other. In this streak procedure, you're taking some of that bacteria and you're kind of moving it around the plate and with each quadrant, there are less and less bacteria. Eventually, they separate out into individual cells. And those individual cells start dividing, and eventually you'll see a visible growth that's called a colony. And what you can assume is that each isolated colony is a pure culture, meaning one type of organism. So you should get into the habit of when you're working with a plate in the lab, you always want to take a colony because a colony is pure, it's been spread out into individuals. If you take it from the big schmear up here, it could still be mixed. And then the other thing is that sometimes people are very attracted to contaminants. They're like, what's that? That looks cool. And I'm like, that doesn't look like the others. So that's not the thing you want, okay? Like, you'll see that the thing that you're interested in all have a uniform look, right? So you have to avoid that thing that doesn't look like all the other stuff because it's probably a contaminant. So commonly, contaminants happen from the air. They can happen from your skin. And I've contaminated a place before, like, plenty of times. Like, even when I do my demo, because I'm kind of, like, doing it quick, I dropped my bacteria onto the plate. So you want to try to avoid contamination by doing aseptic technique. And then you can also isolate specific organisms by using aseptic technique and doing this procedure called a streak for isolation. So usually at some point you're asked to draw a streak for isolation or you're asked to interpret one as being good or bad. Like I think that's what the lab number three, um, the quiz that you'll take online, that's some of the questions they ask you. Like here's a streak, explain why this is good or bad. And good streaks would be that the bacteria are getting diluted and that there's isolated colonies with no contamination. So that would be lab number three, is doing the streak plate. All right, um, this is kind of 
related but like a little bit different. So um, how fast microorganisms grow is called the generation time or the division time. So it's exponential growth and it's the time it takes for like one to become two and then each of those become two and then each of those become two and it keeps growing exponentially. So if you had like one population that started at 10 to the two and then a couple hours later it was like 10 to the five, you have three orders of magnitude difference between them because you just subtract the exponents. And so that's how the growth occurs. It's not one, two, three, four, five, six. It's two, four, um, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, like it goes up really quickly. So the shortest um, time to divide means that you're dividing the fastest. And so typically what you'll see is that bacteria divide the fastest. Okay, like overall, because they're just less complicated. They do binary division. And so that's more simple than mitosis, which is what eukaryotic organisms do. Because remember, algae and protozoa are eukaryotic, and bacteria are prokaryotic. So, like, I don't know how much point one sixteen hour is, but E. coli takes point three five hours, which is like thirty five minutes, right? And so, um, E. coli grows pretty fast. It takes E. coli like. Actually, it's not even half an hour, it's less than that. It's less than half an hour. It's like 20 minutes, like 20 minutes to divide for one E. coli to become two. But if you compare that to like tuberculosis, its generation time is 10 hours. And so let's say that you have a sputum sample from a patient. They have some kind of respiratory funk. And you have a plate like 24 hours later that is just covered in bacteria. It's not tuberculosis. Because tuberculosis, you wouldn't get a plate growth back for like two weeks because it takes it 10 hours to divide one time. So that's another way that you can have like a process of elimination. Things that typically cause infections in people are gonna be growing within 24 to 72 hours, you would see visible growth. And then things that are eukaryotic, it's gonna take longer for them to grow because they do mitosis instead. And mitosis is just a, like more complicated process. So the division time, also known as the generation time, also known as the doubling time. It's the time it takes for the cells to double, the population to double, okay? Bacteria do that the fastest. Okay, so related to that is the bacterial growth curve, and I found this on the internet, I thought it was super cute. So the growth curve, um, is basically how bacteria grow in lab conditions. Okay, how do they grow under artificial conditions? So they grow exponentially, okay, so by powers of exponents, and then these are the stages that they basically follow, and following the curve tells you how, what the population is doing. So when you first start a culture, like let's say you take some from a liquid and you, well this has been shown in broth I should say. Let's say you take some bacteria and you put it in some broth. And that's time equals zero, right? And then at first they're like, where am I? They're like, I just got here, I don't know where this is. So they're not growing. See how that curve is like kind of flat? So in lag phase, they are lagging, they're not growing yet. The bacteria are not dividing really. They're just kind of ramping up. Then there's exponential also known as log phase growth. And what's happening to the population? They're growing. So their growth rate is much greater than their death rate. So the net um, happening is that you're making more bacteria. So this is where their generation time is the shortest because they're growing the fastest. And so they're gonna divide very quickly. Now eventually they will reach equilibrium so it starts getting crowded in there. And they're like, man, we're running out of food. There's too many people, I don't have room. And so the number of new cells will equal to the number of dying cells. And that's why it's flat at the top. And that's called stationary. Stationary means to be still, right? So that's where the live cells equals the dead cells. And then eventually things get really bad and they're like, oh no, we're out of food. This is not cool anymore. We're dying off. 
more than we're reproducing new cells, and that's called death phase. So death phase, the growth dips um, because there's more death than there is new cells. And then some of them can go on what's called a long-term stationary, where they're like, I guess I can wait until someone feeds me again. It's really weird. Like, we throw out a lot of bacteria in the lab. Because once you're done with the culture, you <laughs> put it in autoclave, and then it's gone. But technically, if you just left that culture sitting there for a while, they would eventually all die, but some of them could just hang out for a while. And that's that long-term stationary. So another way that I thought of this in my mind, like a silly way, is like, I think of it as the party, a party analogy. So when you first get to a party, especially if you don't know anyone, you're like, looking around for me, you're like, is there a cat for me to pet so I don't have to like talk to people? So then you just like, okay, I'm at the party, I don't know anyone, let me see what's going on. Let me check out where the food and drink is, I'm just gonna hang out. And then eventually more people are coming into the party that are leaving, right? And that's when the party's like getting really good. Okay, so like your friend comes in, you're like, oh hey. And then more people are coming in that are leaving. And that's the exponential growth of the party. And then eventually it gets to a point where like, okay, some people are saying goodbye, but some people are still saying, and that's stationary. And then eventually the party might deteriorate, like so so-and-so got to a fight, someone peeped in the plant, the neighbors are complaining, more people are leaving the party that are coming in at that point, hopefully, there's always those clueless people that show up at like 12.30, you're like, hey, it's my bedtime. And then long-term stationary is like, oh, so-and-so passed out on the couch, I didn't even know they were still here, like the next day. <laughs> and so then those are the people that are just like hanging out way past their welcome, there's no food or drink left, but they're still there. And you're like, why are you here? So that's my silly way that I think of it in my head, like the party analogy. Um, but really, you're supposed to know what's happening to the microbial growth at each phase. Lag phase, they're not growing. Exponential phase, they're growing the fastest, so they're dividing in the shortest amount of time. Stationary phase, death equals growth. Death phase, death is greater than growth. And then sometimes, if you don't do anything with the culture, they can go into long-term stationary, which is where they're not really growing, but they're not dead. They're just kind of like hanging out, I guess. So this only applies to lab conditions. Okay, they figured this out by plating bacteria for every hour, for like 24 hours to see where the growth was and they just consistently saw that it made this pattern, this exponential pattern. Okay, um, finally, this is the last part of chapter six. Um, a little bit about the biosafety levels. So biosafety levels, are pretty much institutional guidelines that tell you um, what level of containment you need to work with something biological safely. So there's no like hard and fast guidelines, like a lot of it is um, like the, I forgot, they're called NACLs, like the National Lab Safety People or whatever, but then each institution makes its own kind of rules too, to like keep safe. So our teaching lab is biosafety level one. I'd say we're even like minus one, like we work with things that are just not that pathogenic. And so you're very unlikely to get sick. And so notice that the safety equipment is none. Open bench work. We work with things that are not that harmful, so the risk is low, so we don't need a lot of precautions. Next level up would be like at the hospital, if you ever had to stop by the lab and talk to anyone or drop anything off, that would be biosafety level two. So the primary health services, like your, if your clinician has a lab in their building or if there's a lab at the hospital, it's most likely gonna be a biosafety level two. Um, our labs at the university, the pathogens we worked with were biosafety level two. We worked with foodborne pathogens that are a little more pathogenic than your run of the mill like E. coli. And so when you get to biosafety level two, you can work on open bench, but you also have aerosolized um, protocols. So you have a hood that you can work under. And then you're also supposed to wear protective clothing. So at that point, you should be using gloves and a lab coat. I always hated wearing a lab coat, but I would if someone made me. So lab coat and gloves, um, and then a sign. So you have to have a sign that specifically says what you're working with, or at least a ton of biohazard signage when it's biosafety level two. Which you notice on our labs, we don't have that much. Like we don't, I don't even think we have a biosafety on the outside. If we do, it's like small. 
Um, biosafety level three is special diagnostics usually. So let's say you had a sample from a patient that you had to send off to a lab, like you have to send it off to the state lab or to the CDC, then they're probably gonna be biosafety level three. So it's gonna have all the stuff from level two, but more controlled access. So the average person is not just gonna be able to walk into a BSL-3, and then you're gonna have directional airflow to prevent anything from escaping. Um, and you're gonna have a primary device for certain activities. So you're gonna have stations where you can only work with that thing under certain conditions so that you don't necessarily transfer it from one part to another. And then biosafety level four, maximum containment, dangerous pathogens, everything in level three plus airlock entry, shower exit, special waste disposal. So you have to get rid of the waste separate from you would other things. Um, if you've ever seen a facility where people have to disrobe before they can go from one spot to another. Um, and then also the positive pressure suit sometimes. Double ended autoclave, filtered air. So you don't even want stuff escaping from the autoclave, like vent. Everything needs to be contained, like closed off. So the VSL4 is the highest level, but it represents the fewest pathogens that we actually work with. So like very few labs in the world are BSL-4, but BSL-4 means more risky. So what do we mean by risk? Um, things that could kill the people that are working with them, things that don't have a good treatment or a cure, things that are new, things that aren't native to that area. Anthrax. Anthrax is the common example of that. Ebola, anthrax, but there's some other ones that are three slash four. Like sometimes people think, is HIV, like level four, no, not unless they're doing some weird stuff to it to like mutate it. But usually it's things that are incurable, not easily prevented, super contagious, things that are, you don't want released in that part of the world because it's not native to that part of the world. And so that actually represents very few labs. Probably most labs in the country are BSL one or two. Okay, one are the teaching labs and then two are like the most common one that you would encounter, like the hospital lab, diagnostic lab, like DLO, would, they might have a BL3 area, but they're probably mostly BL2, BSL2. So the higher the biosafety level, the more precautions, and the more precautions because the riskier the pathogen, but most labs are not BSL4, like very few are BSL4. Okay. All right, so now we're kind of switching gears to what do you do when you don't want the microbes around? Okay, so chapter six was like, what do I do to get these guys to grow? And chapter seven is like, what do I do when I don't want them to grow? Like, I don't want these things around. And so these are the control of microbial growth. And it's the same situation. There's physical and chemical methods of control. And most of these are fairly easy to understand. Physical methods, you can heat them up. You can do radiation, filtration, freezing, pressure, desiccation, which is drying them out. And then chemical control is stuff like sanitizers and disinfectants and antiseptics. So the difference between a sanitizer and an antiseptic is that antiseptics can be used on living tissue and sanitizers can be used on like non-living tissue. Um, you should know the mechanism of action of soap and related to how soap works is the sh like actual structure of the soap. Um, what factors are important for effective hand washing? Being able to describe those, which most of you already know. And then ranking common microbes by how resistant they are to control mechanisms. So we already kind of noticed during our um, lab last week when you guys used your different sanitizers, that some microbes were kind of resistant to disinfection. Like they grew even after you disinfected. And so just having a general sense of which things are harder to kill and which things are easier to kill. All right, so importance of infection control. So I'm not a clinician, so some of you who do work in clinics probably know more about infection control protocols than I do. Um, and it's kind of dependent on the facility and I guess also what pathogen, what disease you're talking about. This is an example that's um, kind of old now. It wasn't old when I first presented it, but it still is a good example of attempting to do infection control in a hospital setting. And so there was an outbreak in France, a multi-hospital outbreak with an organism that's called KPC. 
um, which is Klebsiella, pneumonia, carbapenemase producing, which I'll explain what that means. Um, and this is a really untreatable infection um, because it's resistant to many antibiotics. And it's often associated with a what called nosocomial infection. So does anyone know what nosocomial means? Where did we say this was happening? In a hospital system. Nosocomial means hospital acquired. Okay, so a lot of these hospital acquired infections are things that live in the environment or live on the body and in the wrong circumstances, like someone being in a hospital, can cause an infection. Okay. All right, so KPC is carbapenemase producing Klebsiella pneumoniae. Um, Klebsiella pneumoniae is something that just lives on your body naturally, but this is a resistant strain of it. So a carbapenemase is an enzyme that breaks down a type of penicillin drug that's called a carbapenem. And carbapenems are like later generation, like really strong penicillin drugs. And this bacterial, this strain, makes an enzyme that degrades all penicillin drugs. And penicillin drugs aren't usually that great for gram negatives anyway, but the ones that would normally work don't work on KPC. So when they look at this in the US, um, they see that it's resistant to carbapenems, which makes sense because it's a carbapenemase producing uh, strain. And it's resistant to piperacillin tabinobacum, which that is a problem because it's a combination drug. So piperacillin is like a penicillin drug and then tabinobacum is an enzyme inhibitor. Well, it's enzyme degrade that. It, it's inhibiting the inhibitor. Like the, the, the part of the drug that's supposed to block that enzyme is not working which is bad, and there's only like three or four of those combinations. Cipro, which is a go-to for gram-negative infection, doesn't work for this, 98% of strains are resistant. Tobermycin, which is again something, it's in the streptomycin family. You could use it if other drugs don't work, but that one doesn't work very well either. And then Cephepime, which I think is a cephalosporin, um, there's a moderate to high resistance level of 60%. So of the strains they've isolated, that's the percentage that are resistant to those drugs. And so you can see that it's gonna make it um, really hard to treat it because even the last resort drugs are not working. So this enzyme, carbapenemase, is I guess gained through horizontal gene transfer. They get the genes to make that enzyme from other bacteria and then it makes them resistant through um, what's called degradation. They literally degrade the drug before it can actually do anything. Okay, so your risk factors for getting KPC, extended hospital stay, being in the ICU, because you're going to have, obviously, something's already seriously wrong with you if you're in the ICU. Pre-existing or underlying disease, that's always going to be the case because it makes you more prone to certain infections. Previous exposure to a wide variety of antibiotics, so if you're someone who's been hospitalized multiple times and been given antibiotics like their candy, <laughs> eventually, the organisms that live in your body can become resistant to those drugs. Um, recent surgery or invasive procedure because that gives the bacteria a place to enter into your body. Um, tracheostomy was seen to be um, at risk for getting KPC um, because this lives in the upper respiratory tract. And so if you have a trach in, then that's another point of opening where you can get an infection. Um, urinary catheter, so it's also found in the urinary tract. and the, They've seen that like pretty much within like minutes of having a catheter in, you start like forming biofilm on the catheter. Like bacteria start like taking up residence. So it used to be like in those long-term care facilities, they leave a catheter in for like days. And now they're like, if, you don't, if it doesn't need to be in there, then it should come out like in a certain amount of time to prevent infections. Um, and especially for older people, because they can get urosepsis a lot easier. Um, and then residents in long-term care facilities because they're more likely to have any of these um, previous conditions. All right, so this chart here is a summary of the results and this is not anything you would memorize. I'm just gonna point out a few things. So first of all, they identified all the cases. The cases were people who um, basically were um, either colonized or suspected to be infected with KPC. So you might wonder like, what's the difference? So colonization is where you're just carrying it. Like you don't, you're not necessarily having a disease process. 
And then infection is where you're actually having like disease symptoms potentially related to it. Um, and so what is the importance of recognizing people that are just colonized? Yeah, they can transmit it to other people. And so they were like, okay, they can transmit it to people. Now how are they transmitting it? Because this particular hospital system in this country, France, had not seen KPC before. Um, and it is here in the US now, like it's been seen in pretty much all the states. So they didn't know where it was coming from. They're like, uh, where is this coming from? So they start testing the surrounding areas and they went and saw who was going to different hospitals. And they noticed that it actually came from another country um, because the index case, the source case was from Greece. And so that person went to hospital A and then there's a person who was in hospital B and then an index case in hospital A who got it from the source case that was in hospital A. This is the contact tracing. And this is why we had to make the seating charts like for COVID, because I'm like, okay, so-and-so was here, who's most at risk? And then they're like, oh, this is a contact case of number three, who was in A, and that was a contact case of three. And then this person was transferred to hospital A, and so they're like, oh my gosh, these people just like were going everywhere. And luckily it wasn't more cases. And the, probably the reason it wasn't is because of how they figured out that it's transmitted. And what they noticed was that if you had a duodenoscopy in hospital B, then you were more likely to be infected with KPC. So they saw that the people that had had the scope in that hospital were more likely to have actual infection. Okay, it wasn't across the board perfect. Some people were just colonized with it, but they were more likely to actually be infected if they had had that procedure in hospital B. Okay, and people had been being transferred to multiple hospitals. And they identified the index case at each hospital, and then who was a contact of each of those people. So the duodenoscope is what you use to do like an upper GI series. So people that have biliary problems or pancreatitis or stomach cancers or whatever, they can do this scope procedure where they go from the mouth down into the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine, and they look around. And the problem with an instrument like this is that you can't sterilize that whole thing, right? Because it's got a light and a camera. And that would be damaged by like an auto clip. Um, and so what they actually ended up finding out was that it, it was not drying adequately. So what would be the problem if cleaning the scope, you leave water behind? Yeah, it can harbor bacteria, right? Moisture is gonna breed bacteria. So they're like, okay, it's probably because the drying stuff is inadequate. And then they were only testing it every six months for I don't know what, like if, if, an, if an instrument is broken at all, like let's say it has cracks or anything in it, like dental instruments, for example, or if they're rusted, that gives bacteria a place to hide, like down in, like viruses and stuff can hide down in there. So they started checking it every month and they cultured it for the bacteria of interest because they didn't know that KPC was a thing. So they started testing specifically for KPC to make sure that the scope was clean. And then I've heard in some hospitals they started using partially disposable parts that you can get rid of afterwards. Um, the patient, they sampled the, the areas that the patient were in, like living, but they didn't really find it in the environment. They were like, eh, it doesn't seem to be around there. And then they tested the healthcare workers and they didn't have it, none of them had it. So it was directly transmitted from patient to patient via the scope, most likely. It didn't seem like luckily for the patients that the healthcare workers were carrying it from one patient to another. Okay, they, it seemed to be through that scope because it's a pretty invasive procedure. It's going like halfway down your body. All right, so then they were like, all right, we're gonna stop transferring people around. Okay, so we're gonna limit our transfer of patients. We're gonna cohort our cases and contact patients in a separate unit and they're gonna have their own healthcare workers until discharge. Which you can imagine, those of you that are clinicians, this is like scheduling nightmare probably, right? At first you're like, okay, these people can only work with these patients or since they're on the KPC ward, now you stay on the KPC ward. And that was okay because it wasn't really seeming to harm the healthcare workers. Like they didn't seem to be colonized with it. And then they added contact precautions. So you've all seen those rooms where if you're dozy like me, you walk by at the hospital and you're like, what's going on in there? 
because they got like a little sign that says like, hey, you can't come in here because blah, blah, blah. So they started putting those signs up on the door so that people would know to dress a certain way when they came in. You're always going to reinforce hand hygiene because that's the easiest thing to fix. Um, and you would be surprised. People would be washing their hands like in the clinical setting like you think they should. Um, and then system, uh, systematic screening of contact patients. So they basically, anyone who had had even a remote contact, they just screened them for the disease. And then eventually the outbreak just kind of stopped. So luckily there wasn't a ton of deaths, but it could have been worse because you had a vulnerable population and you had a un previously unknown kind of organism in that system and one that's difficult to treat. And these people are already have comorbidities, so they're already sick. All right, uh, now there's a bunch of boring definitions. Um, <laughs> so basically how I would summarize this is that there are levels to how clean something needs to be for you to work with it safely. And I think you kind of know this. So like if you're going to have a surgery, you need to be sterile. Like sterile means nothing is growing. But if you're just like washing your dishes at home, like the dishwasher is hot enough to get rid of most stuff. Like you're, and it's, all, and it's your own stuff, right? So the risk is different. You're not internally putting dishes in yourself like you are surgical instruments. And so there's a difference between sterilization and sanitization. And you might have even have noticed on the bottles of cleaner that you guys took home that they said to sanitize, leave on for blah, blah, blah minutes, and to sterilize or disinfect or whatever the term they use, leave it on for this amount of minutes. And so the time that you apply the treatment does matter depending on how much killing you're trying to do. So in the general sense in a hospital setting where you need the highest standard of you know, non-contamination, you're gonna do sterilization. And then at home and restaurants and other public places, you're gonna do sanitization. Um, then there's some other things to take into consideration. Commercial sterilization is kind of similar to sanitization, but a little bit of a higher level where you do need it to be sterile, but you can't like <laughs> vaporize it because you have a product that you're trying to keep intact, right? So like um, I think about food products, right? Like you want your food to be pasteurized. You want it to be heat protected. But well, you can't heat it so high that the food disintegrates, right? Because then you, the integrity of the food is gone. It's not going to taste good. Like you're not trying to burn it. You're just trying to heat it enough to get rid of the stuff. Um, when you guys were using soap in the class, that was a de-germing mechanism. So you're physically removing the germs from the surface, not necessarily killing them. And then we talked about how there's a difference between antiseptic versus disinfectant or sanitizer. The antiseptic is used for living tissue and mucous membranes, and then the sanitizer is used for inanimate objects. And so on your instructions, you might have said, do you want to sanitize or disinfect? Disinfect is the timing that would be required to remove harmful stuff. So you, I think usually the disinfection time is going to be longer than the sanitation time, the sanitization time. Okay, so they have different names for what it kills, and you might have seen this on some of the cleaner bottles that you looked at, or if you work in a hospital or clinic and you see the special industrial cleaners that are for hospitals. And biocides are also known as germicides, and this is just giving you the vernacular in case you see it, you know what it means. Side means to kill. So those kill microbes, you also have fungicides, viricides, those will kill funguses and viruses. You also have bactericidal, those will kill bacteria. So a lot of times they want an all-purpose cleaner that will kill all the things. Um, and they test in the lab to see how well that, that goes. Um, sepsis is bacterial contamination. So we want to do things aseptically. We don't want to have contamination. And then an antimicrobial agent, if you see that term, it's talking usually about medication. So an antimicrobial would be like an antibiotic or an antifungal or something like that. Okay, so one of the things that we um, talked about a little bit in lab is like, what determines how well these cleaners worked? And so these are some factors that determine how effective an antimicrobial substance is, whether it's a sanitizer or what. 
So the number of microbes, and I think that kind of makes sense. The more contaminated a surface is, the harder it is to disinfect it, right? Like there's areas in your home that are constantly funky. It's just a bad one. Like the toilet seat or around the toilet. I would say the floor, I would venture the floor around the toilet is actually maybe dirtier than the seat. But it's going to be hard to make it totally sterile because there's always going to be microbes there. Um, the other thing is the environmental influences. So, like, if we think about COVID as an example, everyone was hopeful at first, like, hey, when it's summertime, COVID will just, like, go away. Like, the flu goes away, right? Because we're like, maybe COVID doesn't like the heat. And COVID's like, I don't care about that. <laughs> COVID's like, I like everything, apparently, right? Because we've already seen that in the lower hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, they already went through summer. We should have known that that wasn't going to work because they went through summer and the cases didn't necessarily go away. Now with the flu, it's a little bit different. Flu actually does thrive in the cold. And so you do see flu go down in the summer. And so those environmental influences, like the temperature, and that's why some things have seasonality to it because it has to do with the climate, sometimes in the weather, which things are better at surviving because that also influences human behavior, right? So like you're more likely to have a picnic with sketchy potato salad in the summer, right? So food poisoning is actually more common in the summertime because you're doing more questionable things and making YOLO decisions. You're like, it's fine, it's been sitting there for a while, I'm gonna eat it. So environmental influences include human behavior, I think. Like human behavior is gonna make a different risk. Um, time of exposure, so I've always joked about this, like, oh, you, oh there's directions on the cleaning bottle? Hmm, interesting. You're supposed to like leave it on there for a certain amount of time. And that does matter, I guess, because some microbes, it takes longer to inactivate them. And some chemicals, it takes longer for it to work. So you have to leave it on there the minimum amount of time. Um, is there anyone in here who's been, what do you call them, like the sterilization techs? Like, I don't know what you call them. Has anyone in here ever done that job? Okay. Like, I think, I don't know if a lot of places you do it yourself. Like, I guess if you're like a dental hygienist, do they, I don't know if they have a person that does it, but um, anyway, you would be familiar with like, okay, it has to be this amount of time and this amount of temperature and all that. Um, and then the microbial characteristics is probably the biggest thing. Um, some microbes are naturally more resistant than others. And that's what this is showing an example of. They're comparing three different organisms, Staph, E. coli, Pseudomonas, both are things that are commonly around, like in the environment and on your body. And they made a layer of bacteria on the plate, and then they put these paper discs on it that had different anti-sanitizer um, anti, uh, things in it. And so you notice that some things don't work across the board on everything. So for example, chlorine works pretty good on staph, like it actually kills it. And it works pretty good on E. coli too, but it doesn't do a lot to pseudomonas. And in fact, what's up with pseudomonas? Like what's its problem? It didn't get killed by anything. Okay, so like pseudomonas is a concern because, you know, it's in the environment and it's hard to disinfect it. And if it's hard to disinfect it on a surface, it's going to be really hard to get to it if it's in a person. Like pseudomonas is something that causes like ventilator associated pneumonia in people a lot. Um, and so there are levels to how resistant things are. Bleach usually works pretty good, but it doesn't work that good on pseudomonas. Okay, so you can see that there's different resistance profile. Like whatever this hexchlorophene is, I think it's a hospital cleaner, it didn't do anything to E. coli. Okay, so like that's why, um, you know, following the instructions matters um, and knowing what, what you are most at risk for, I guess, which pathogen matters. And typically, gram-negative bacteria are more resistant than gram-positive bacteria, which is something we mentioned before. Okay. So how else can you get rid of these guys besides changing human behavior? Um, temperature. So you can apply heat, and they have different ways of measuring heat uh, resistance. Um, basically, in the lab, they'll decide, like, okay, um, we apply this amount of heat for 10 minutes. What amount of heat do we have to apply to kill them in 10 minutes? Um, or how long do we have to apply this heat to kill like 90% of them. And that's where you get these guidelines about like food temperature, for example. Like there's a reason that they're like, put poultry to 165 plus, because what they saw is that at that temperature, it will 
get rid of enough microbes to prevent illness. So then, um, if you think of this logically, like let's say you had two organisms that you were comparing. And I said, okay, organism number one was killed in five minutes when I applied 70 degrees Celsius. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna apply the same temperature to both. One of them was killed in five minutes, the other one was killed in one minute. Which one is more resistant to heat? The one that it took five minutes to kill, right? That's all they're saying here is that the things that are more heat resistant will take longer to kill if you compare the same temperature than the things that are less heat resistant. Um, how can you do heat sterilization? So you can do the moist heat, which is boiling, or steam. Steam under pressure is the autoclave. Um, and then you can use dry heat, which is what you guys do with the vacuum incinerators. They both have the same effect, basically, is that they are oxidizing, but they also just literally, like, destroy the cells. So it causes, like, a thermolysis. Okay, so they have recommended heat requirements for food products and for sterilization because in the lab they've seen if you apply X amount of heat for X amount of time, it'll kill 90% or more of the population of bacteria. Okay, and different bacteria have different resistance to heat. Some of them are more resistant than others. Okay, special kind of heat is pasteurization developed by Louis Pasteur who was like, I need to save my wine and my beer. How do I keep this going longer? And so then he figured out like, oh, if I rapidly heat it and rapidly cool it, I will get rid of most of the spoilage organisms. And the benefit of that is that the spoilage organisms are not necessarily ones that will kill you, but if you kill them, then you also kill the pathogens, potentially. And so it's a way to make your food and drink safe. And so that's showing a big old pasteurization machine with all the chambers in it and um, how it does that rapid heating and cooling and it comes out pasteurized. So we know that most of this, most of us are familiar with pasteurization of milk. Um, I've heard like, I don't know why people drink raw milk. I wouldn't. I'm like, have you seen a cow teeth before? Like, have you seen a cow? Like, they're dirty. And uh, maybe it tastes good, I guess. But um, to me, it would just taste like bacteria. I couldn't do it. So, and especially feeding it to like babies. Like, there's been outbreaks of um, food poisoning from raw milk and people were giving it to their kid. I'm like, no. Like, don't do that. Um, so pasteurized milk is good um, because it kills all the microbes because of the rapid heating and the cooling. And that idea of equivalent treatments is basically that, and it doesn't always work. So like, if you think about cooking as an example, let's say you're like, man, I'm hungry, I want my pizza rolls. And you're like, okay, I'm gonna cook them for, I'm gonna do 350 degrees and I'll do it for like 15 minutes or however long. You can't do 500 degrees for like one minute because you're gonna like, or two minutes because you're gonna like burn down your house probably. But it does work in certain food processing where if you apply more heat, you can do it for less time. Okay, and I think that kind of makes sense. Like you can apply more heat and do it for less time. And so that's what they've done with the ultra pasteurized. So if you ever see milk on the shelf, you know, like what's up with milk on the shelf? It's because they do the ultra high temp pasteurization. So instead of doing 74 for like 20 seconds, they do 138 for like three seconds. So by doing it higher, you get rid of more pathogens so it can be stable at room temperature and it won't spoil. But you also do it for a short amount of time so you don't destroy the milk, so that you don't destroy the flavor and consistency and all that. All right, filtration, most people are okay. They kind of understand this. Filters physically block microbes from passing from one area to another, whether you're filtering liquid or you're filtering air. The way this filtration works is that the membrane of the filter, it has pores in it, and those pores are small enough that it traps the microbes up against the filter. Some of them might be able to wiggle through, but for the most part, you can see the bacteria are all piled up against the pores, they can't get through. So we used to use this little device that was called a Steriflip, if we had, um, like say we had cell culture media, you can't autoclave it because it'll mess up all the proteins that the cells need to live. But you need it to be sterile because if your media is contaminated, the cells will die. So you take that cell media 
and you put it in this little cup, and you hook it up to a vacuum hose, and it pulls it through the filter, and so when it comes out the other side, it's sterile. And then you can use that, then they have a little sterile cap that they give you, and you just switch it out, and now you have a sterilized liquid that you can use to grow your cells in. So that was one way that we used it. If there's something that you can't safely heat, then you can use a filter to sterilize it. Okay, you can also do low temperature. Most of us know this. This is why we refrigerate our food as quickly as possible um, to prevent microbial growth from occurring on our food. Um, you can also do high pressure. So a lot of times in food processing, they have high pressure and temperature, like a lot of things work synergistically, where if you do more than one thing, it kind of has an overall amplified effect as far as getting rid of microbes. Um, desiccation is where you remove the water, so you can dry it out, like freeze drying uh, procedure. And then osmotic pressure can be controlled by the salt and sugars that you put. So a lot of people don't love food preservatives, but the reason that they preserve the food is a lot of times they have salts, and those salts will dry out the bacterial cells, and it'll put an osmotic pressure on those cells that'll prevent spoilage organisms from growing. Okay. All right, you can also use radiation. So radiation, um, the shorter the wavelength, the more energy that radiation has. So a lot of times um, we use UV radiation, like we had a hood that had a UV light in it and you could leave your instruments in there to kind of help and you've probably seen it like at the salon too, like they'll have a little UV like area to put the little tools in. Um, hopefully they would have an autoclave, but I know that that's expensive so not all places probably have it. But I think it's okay to use like the barbicide stuff, like which is the strong um, sanitizer and then use your UV light and heat, like you can use a heat box, and that will kill most things. So the problem with radiation, why does it kill? Um, it destroys the DNA, essentially. So it destroys the DNA, and that can <coughs> basically kill the organism. Now certain forms of radiation don't work as well as others. Microwaves are a little misleading, because even though the food gets hot, you'll notice that it has an uneven heating in it. So like you'll think, oh, this is good, it's ready to eat, and then you get a cold pocket. And I guess it's because it heats the water around in the food. And so the water actually takes a lot of energy input to get heated up. And that's why you end up with cold pockets, which means that your food, like microwaving to get rid of microbes is not really that helpful, unless you've really stirred your food around uh, in between heating it. Like I've heard about people microwaving sponge, I'm like, my husband's like, what keeps happening to the sponge? And I'm like, well, you see, husband, you keep leaving it in the water, and it gets funky, and if it smells funky, I'm like, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Like, sponges are, like, pretty much worthless. Like, I think they're meant to be, like, one time only. I think it's better to use a clean dish rag and just, like, wash it, because sponges are just funky. So if you got a funky sponge, don't use it. Don't use it on your dishes. Okay. All right, and don't microwave it, because that doesn't work. Okay, so then there's um, different kinds of sanitizer. This is going back to the sanitizers a little bit. The two main categories are oxidizing or non-oxidizing. So bleach is an aggressive killer. And then ammonia, like Lysol, is more subtle, but it will still kill. And so most of the sanitizers that you guys probably used at home fall into one of these categories, and they work pretty much the same. Like one of them is more aggressive, like bleach is, most of us know bleach is pretty aggressive killer. And I actually like, kind of like the smell of bleach, like I'm like, yes. Kill, kill them. Um, but anyway, they, they work generally the same. Okay. All right, um, I'm going to stop here for now because I don't want to cut up the description of the soap. So we're almost done with Chapter 7. So we're going to move into Chapter 8 next time also. Okay. All right, I'll see you guys later. Have a good day.